Thank you for the introduction. Hello, everyone. I'm Nilofar Tempal. I'm the Associate Director in the Office of Bioequivalence in the Office of Genetic Drugs at the FDA. My colleague, Dr. Shujin Chen, and I will be presenting jointly on the culture of quality as it relates to data integrity. I'll provide an overview of quality culture and data integrity at the Center of Patient-Focused Genetic Drug Development. And Dr. Chen will present on quality culture and data integrity from a GMP perspective. OGD presented on data integrity at last year's Generic Drug Forum. The fact that we are discussing this again underscores agencies' concerns and seriousness of the issue before us. Specifically, in recent years, we are seeing new lows in data integrity involving data falsification. Data submitted to the agency being fabricated or altered in a way that it is no longer accurate and reliable. And this can affect the patients. Here's the outline of my presentation. I'll discuss the importance of data integrity and quality in a patient-centric genetic drug development approach and agencies experience from the generic applications. Then I'll provide an overview of the tools that are critical for ensuring data integrity and also discuss how each of the stakeholders can meet their responsibility of ensuring data integrity. In a patient-centric approach, patients are front and center of what we do. Both regulators and pharmaceutical industry work to improve the lives of patients by making drugs available for them. Patients trust and expect, and rightly so, that when they purchase an FDA-approved generic drug, it is safe, effective, and of high quality. To meet this expectation, the agency builds confidence in data by verifying the information in the submissions during ENDA assessments, inspections, and follow-ups on confidential complaints if received. Similarly, applicants and third parties with whom the applicants contract need to ensure that the study data submitted to the agency meets the standards of quality and integrity. Both in data integrity and quality are the cornerstones of regulatory decisions. They both embrace the principles of ALCOA and both can apply to the same data set. And you will hear more on ALCOA in subsequent presentations. Data integrity answers whether the data can be trusted. For example, I can rely on the results from bioanalysis if I'm assured that the data are accurate, complete, and consistent representation of what occurred during their collection, documentation, reporting, and retention. Data quality, on the other hand, means you can use the data to support the application if they are generated in compliance with the applicable standards. Again, using an example from bioanalysis, the accuracy and precision of a method should be within plus or minus 15%. That's an acceptable industry and regulatory practice. Now, if this 15% criteria are not met, even though the uh, integrity of the data set is not in question, the data from that method may not support the application. So integrity and quality are both important to decision making. This slide shows the types of data integrity issues observed in generic applications during inspections and assessments. They extend to all parts of the submissions. For the clinical portion of the bioequivalent study, we see, for example, unethical conduct for inclusion of patients who do not present a specific disease condition, or dosing subjects prior to screening them for eligibility in the study. For bioanalysis and statistics, we see manipulated data used in statistical analysis not investigating frequent run failures or large internal standard variations. We also see sample substitution and deliberate misinformation. For drug product manufacturing, some examples include fabricated data invalidating out-of-spec results without justification. For non-clinical studies, uh, we find the same data set being reported for different species, biological implausible data, and others. The common theme for these observations is that they all involve 
uh, uh, violations of the principles of ALCOA. Compliance with data integrity is important. For patients, it ensures access to new drugs and affordable generic drugs that are safe, effective, and meet all the quality standards. For businesses, having a mature uh, system in place to ensure integrity provides a competitive edge over the others. Plus, it can boost the organization's reputation and credibility and minimize loss of revenues from uh, um, recalls, downgrades, or repeating the studies. For the agency, also there is the benefit that there is reduced regulatory risk as decisions would be based on reliable and quality data. And furthermore, it ensures efficient use of uh, agencies' limited resources, which can be focused on uh, assessments and approval of the applications in the pipeline rather than on activities like um, regulatory actions, warning letters, follow-up inspections, etc. Now let's turn to the tools to achieve data integrity. First is the establishment of a robust and mature quality uh, and risk management system. It starts with identifying potential sources that compromise your systems. And systems would include man, machine, and methods. In, so investing in, two, uh, in automation and technology and having less human touch points or interventions can help to remove the potential sources of errors. And in addition to a matured quality system, instilling a culture of quality in the organization can also go a long way in ensuring data integrity. And applicants and CROs need to invest in these tools proactively. Two key points to bear in mind for the quality management system, QMS. First, the QMS is not a one-size-fits-all approach. The risk to the data will dictate the elements of QMS to be incorporated and the granularity to which you go. Even from one study to another, you may need to tweak your existing system to integrate uh, risks which are unique to the study. So it helps to step back and assess the task-specific risk first. Second, QMS is a dynamic system, as shown here. It's not a one-time setup and done system. So after a system is built and implemented, it is important to monitor its effectiveness to detect any breaches in the data, identify the root causes uh, of, of invalid data. And once you have this information, you will refine your processes, controls, or technology to integrate this newly identified risk to quality into your quality management system. And it's this continual monitoring and improvement which makes it a dynamic system. A robust uh, QMS at the testing site should be complemented by the organization's culture of quality. And that's a work environment where personnel at all levels in the organization think about patient safety and they put quality first. And it starts at the top with the leadership being committed to cultivating such a work envi environment and leading by examples. Leadership needs to articulate detailed policies regarding the um, code of conduct and also the compliance with regulations. And then they should provide clear guidelines for the implementation so people understand how they should work within the bounds of the corporate culture. Reporting errors and deviations should be encouraged and viewed as an opportunity to understand a previously unidentified risk and then mitigate it. So this goes back to refining the QMS, uh, which I mentioned on the previous slide. Also like the QMS, building a a uh, culture of quality is an iterative process. It's not a one and done thing. It needs reinforcement through continued education and training. And while quality, quality control and quality assurance departments have their place within an organization, it is important for leadership to underscore integrity and quality of data as everyone's responsibility within the organization. Let's look at the applicant's role in data integrity. When applicants outsource the studies and delegate portions of their responsibility to the CRO, 
They are accountable for assuring the integrity of outsourced study-related activities. It's in their benefit to select uh, a CRO who is committed to delivering a quality product and has already invested in the data integrity tools. Applicants uh, need to provide uh, CROs a full understanding of the study risk, both risk to the subjects if their rights and welfares are not protected and risk to the data if the system is compromised. Staff involved in the study conduct, including the physicians, nurses, analysts, quality assurance, should all comprehend the study risks. And applicants should also ensure that CROs understand the regulatory requirements for the transfer uh, responsibilities and the FDA's expectations. It's imperative that applicants provide monitoring and oversight for the critical aspects of the study independent of the site's quality assurance and then document the monitoring and communications with the site management in sufficient details to allow verification if the need arises. It's also the applicant's responsibility to confirm the reliability of the data from the CRO prior to submitting it to the agency, and we often see that not being the case. Now let's look at how the agency plays its role, and I'll focus only on the generic applications. We follow a multidisciplinary and collaborative approach. Uh, both assessors and investigators are sensitive to the possibility of inaccurate, withheld, or otherwise false data in the submission. And so they work collaboratively if data integrity is suspected during the assessment of the applications. The assessor may request a focus inspection if they suspect the data to be compromised. And remember, it doesn't have to be uh, intentional compromise every time. Unintentional compromise also points to a less than optimum QMS. Additionally, they may perform investigative analysis if the data manipulation is suspected to be systemic in nature. And we also follow up on complaints and information received from external sources. You may find the two mailboxes linked at the bottom of the slide helpful for communicating with the agency. Um, next, in collaboration with our colleagues from the Office of Biostatistics, the agency developed tools to facilitate detection of certain types of data manipulation. And we plan to continue our efforts with enhanced analytics to verify the integrity of study data during assessment of NDAS. We also plan to publish a guidance in the future on data integrity for BABE studies at the testing sites. So I'll end this presentation with three takeaways. One, FDA expects that all data submitted in NDAS be reliable and accurate because generic drugs should meet FDA standards of interchangeability and high quality medicines. Applicants are accountable for assuring the integrity of all outsourced study related activities. Contracting uh, the work to a CRO does not absolve them of their responsibility. And the third is that leadership at the testing site should proactively invest in tools um, and policies to enhance data integrity compliance. And the emphasis here being on, is on being proactive about it. Also remember, QMS and corporate culture are not a one and done thing. QMS should remain flexible and dynamic, and the quality culture needs commitment and continued reinforcement. That concludes my presentation. Thank you for your attention. I'll be joining the panel later and will be happy to take questions. I'll turn it over now to Dr. Chen. Thank you. Thank you, Nanufar, for the nice opening presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shu Jin Chen. I am currently a Senior Pharmaceutical Quality Assessor at Office of Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Assessment in OPQ. Now that we heard about an overview of the importance of data integrity and data quality for ENDA submissions from the OGD and OB perspective, I will continue the topic of culture of quality from the OPQ perspective and focus on data integrity in the context of CGMP compliance. By the end of my talk, I hope you will be able to 
understand data integrity as part of CGMP compliance requirement and its impact on application review. Discuss the critical role of a firm's management in creating a quality culture that supports data integrity. And define the role of OPQO PMA in data integrity assessment. I will begin by reviewing data integrity and CGMP. As we know, CGMP refers to the current good manufacturing practice regulations enforced by the FDA. CGMPs are systems that assure proper design, monitoring, and control of processes and facilities. According to the FDA guidance for industry, data integrity and compliance with drug CGMP, questions and answers, published in December of 2018. Data integrity refers to the completeness, consistency, and accuracy of data. Specifically, data need to be attributable, legible, contemporaneously recorded, original or a true copy, and accurate. From the regulatory standpoint, data integrity breach is a violation of CGMP, which can mean adulterated drug. Under U.S. law, adulterated drug is subject to detention. Generally, significant CGMP issues require reinspection. In addition to CGMP compliance, data integrity is also critical to application review. FDA must have confidence that application data is a true and a reliable representation of drug quality. Ensuring data integrity is also a critical component of the industry's responsibility to ensure the safety, efficacy, and quality of drugs, and of FDA's ability to protect public health. Any breach in data integrity breaks trust of both the regulator and the general public. FDA regularly conducts data inspection as part of CGMP inspections. All records under CGMP are subject to FDA inspection. The agency is allowed to conduct authorized inspection, review, and copying of records, including copying of electronic data. Records can also be requested in advance of or in lieu of an inspection under Section 704A4 of the FDNC Act which has seen increased use during the current pandemic. FDA has increasingly observed CGMP violations involving data integrity during inspections. For example, according to a recent Redica Systems report, in fiscal year 2020, there are 57 citations related to 21168B which states appropriate controls shall be exercised over computer systems. It demonstrates FDA's continued focus on data management and data integrity, particularly for electronic data. This slide provides some examples from the recent warning letters involving data integrity, which include data control issues, such as lack of controlled access to computer systems, disabled audit trail, data recording issues, such as not recording activities contemporaneously, backdating, data manipulation, such as deleted data, fabricating data, copying existing data as new data, testing control issues, such as trial injections in standalone equipment and testing into compliance as well as investigation and CAPA issues, such as lack of root cause analysis, inadequate OOS investigations, and inadequate CAPAs. There appear to be some myths about data integrity breaches, such as DI issues are only QC issues in the laboratory. There's only one system that is affected. There's only one person doing the wrong thing that is responsible. Senior management are not responsible. They could not have known. 
Fixing BI issues is just a matter of improving an SOP, having a training session, or firing an employee. In reality, what we often observe at firms with DI violations are there's a lack of basic laboratory controls to prevent changes to electronic data. The firm routinely retested samples without justification and deleted analytical data. There is systemic data manipulation across facility, including actions taken by multiple analysts on multiple pieces of testing equipment and for multiple drugs. Which suggests a system-wide lack of culture of quality. Why is quality culture important? According to the same FTA guidance for industry on data integrity, Firms should implement meaningful and effective strategies to manage data integrity risks. Management's involvement is essential in preventing and correcting DI problems. It is the role of management with executive responsibility to create a quality culture that supports data integrity. Without management support, quality systems can break down and lead to CGMP non-compliance. This slide provides a case example of a deficient quality culture. Where we observed the quality unit is aware of lack of controls in computer systems but failed to correct problems. Site quality system is inadequate to ensure integrity of data generated at facilities. Site senior management failed to take sufficient action to prevent recurrence of DI problems. There is systemic data manipulation and other CGMP violations at multiple sites. On the flip side, we can refer to the same FDA guidance on data integrity for what an effective quality culture looks like. According to this guidance, an effective quality culture is one where employees understand that data integrity is an organizational core value, where employees are encouraged to identify and promptly report data integrity issues, and where there is clear accountability for data integrity in the organizational structure. Firms can also consider implementing an enhanced ethics program with clear management support, which will educate the employees about what constitutes an unethical behavior and actually hold them accountable for ethics violations, such as data falsification. In terms of effective management strategy, we understand that data integrity problems are not always intentional. Sometimes they result from poorly controlled systems. Therefore, FDA often recommends, as part of the firm's corrective action and preventative action plan, they need to describe actions such as revising procedures, implementing new controls, training or retraining personnel, or other steps to prevent the recurrence of CGMP violations, including breaches of data integrity, as taken from this warning letter. Now that we heard about the relation between data integrity and CGMP compliance, as well as the importance of the culture of quality in preventing and correcting DI problems, I would like to switch gear a little bit and discuss OPMA's role in data reliability assessment. As we know, DI issues may be identified during surveillance inspections, pre-approval inspections, or in submitted application data. FDA conducts concurrent and parallel assessments between ORA, OCOMQ, which is primarily responsible for assessing DI impact on distributed commercial products, and OPQOPMA, which is responsible for assessing DI impact on pending applications. 
Our assessments focus on corrective actions to prevent recurrence, as well as remediation efforts to determine impact on completed activities, including released product and submitted data. You will hear more about our data reliability assessment process in a later talk from my OPMA colleague, Biontech O, in the same session. Our data integrity assessment process is a collaborative process. For pending applications, OPMA evaluates DI findings, responses, and the corrective actions to determine if there is sufficient demonstration of accuracy of application data. If the firm provided confidence that pending applications impacted are reviewable. A key question we need to address is whether the quality of BE batch can be confirmed. If not, Repeat BE studies using material of reliable quality may be indicated. OPMA actively collaborates with internal review disciplines from both OPQ and OGDOB to resolve DI questions and determine whether BE batch was impacted or a new BE study is warranted, where collaborations and knowledge sharing are key to success. To summarize my talk today, data integrity is a requirement of CGMP. DI breaches can be adulterated drug. Management role is critical in creating a quality culture that supports data integrity. Evaluation of data integrity is a crucial aspect of OPMA's application review. OPMA actively collaborates with internal review disciplines in OPQ and OGDOB to resolve DI questions. Here are today's challenge questions from both Nanufars and my talk. Question number one, which of the statements are true? A, applicants are ultimately accountable for the integrity and quality of the data in ANDAS. B, testing site management is responsible for the integrity and quality of the data generated at a site. C, both A and B. The correct answer is C, both A and B. Question number two. Which of the following statements is not true? A, data integrity refers to the completeness, consistency, and accuracy of data. B, data integrity breach is a violation of CGMP. C, Senior management is not responsible for and could not have known about data integrity breaches. D, an effective quality culture is where employees understand that data integrity is an organizational core value and employees are encouraged to identify and promptly report data integrity issues. The correct answer is C. Senior management is not responsible for and could not have known about data integrity breaches. This is an incorrect statement. In closing, I will leave you with this question. Are you satisfied with your company's quality culture to support data integrity? I will address your questions at the end of this session during the Q&A and panel discussion. Thank you for your attention. Good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction. The title of my presentation today is Data Integrity and Data Quality in Application Submissions. In today's presentation, I will talk about what is data integrity, importance of data integrity, and how can we assure the quality and the integrity of data. I will then present some case studies and followed by discussion of advantages of early reporting, then the summary and the future steps. This slide shows the definition of data integrity from 2018 FDA guidance. Data integrity refers to completeness, consistency, and accuracy of data. Complete, consistent, and the accurate data should be attributable, legible, contemporaneously recorded, original or true copy, and accurate. 
The integrity and the quality of data in application submissions are very important. Poor data quality, whether due to sloppiness or fabricated data, has the potential to undermine the ability of FDA to provide appropriate analysis as part of drug product approval process. Implementation and the use of a quality management system to data governance should ensure the control over the data life cycle and with the principles of quality risk management. How can we assure data integrity and data quality in application submissions? We can use a guideline and the inspection. This slide shows the guideline for investigator is that they should permit monitoring and auditing by applicant and sponsor and the inspection by appropriate regulatory authority. Applicant often use it for ANDA submission and the sponsor use it for NDA submission. Investigator upon the request of a monitor, auditor, or regulatory authority, they should make available for direct access to all related study records. Applicant and sponsor may need to update the process and the procedures for both clinical and analytical studies and to ensure the compliance with the applicable regulations. The guideline for applicant as sponsor is they are responsible for implementing and maintaining quality assurance and a quality control system with the written SOPs. They should ensure that clinical studies for either by availability study or by equivalent study are conducted and the data are generated, documented, and are reported in compliance with the protocol and the applicable regulation requirements. They should ensure direct access to all study-related sites, source data or documents, and the reports for purpose of monitoring and auditing by the applicants and the inspection by regulatory authorities. The quality control should be applied to all stage of data handling for clinical and bioanalytical studies and to ensure that all data are reliable and have been processed correctly. Inspection also can use it to assure data integrity and data quality in application submission. Office of Study Integrity and Surveillance, we often call OSIS, they conduct inspection to the study site and evaluate the information from inspection and a classify inspection into one of three categories. There can be no action indicated or NAI, or voluntary action indicated VAI, or official action indicated OAI. OAI classification usually means that the inspected entity must invest significant resources into correcting the objectionable conditions that FDA has identified, including any observed data integrity issues. However, NAI or VAI does not necessarily mean that data is reliable. In addition to use guideline and inspection, review decision also play an important role in assuring data integrity and data quality in application submission. Review division can determine whether the data in application is reliable when classification is not OAI. However, there is still a data integrity concern. Review division can request a forecast inspection if found the integrity concern for clinical or bioanalytical data. For example, if they found uh, following data anomalies, they found a similar PK profiles. Uh, between subjects or unusual PK trends. I will further explain this type of, uh, this two type of data anomaly in later case presentation. Are they all, there's a suspected uh, switching test and reference products or making dilution in order to make study pass. In next few slides, I will present some case studies.
this case one is that FDA inspection, multiple inspection to the study sign and find, um, find an investigator or CRO failed to conduct a systemic and a thorough evaluation to identify and the correct sources of contamination. They also failed to investigate the data anomalies. There's a lack of assay reproducibility between the original and the repeated results. The assay accuracy cannot be assured under the condition of sample processing. And there is a biased exclusion of study data resulting in the acceptance of failed runs. Then the field to demonstrate the accuracy of analytical method with the appropriate validation experiments and the documentation. So the classification for this uh, inspection for the site is OAI. FDA recommend action is to either perform an independent audit of results by third party, or they can re assay all the samples at a different facility and provide stability data for those samples. And then they can repeat the study at another site. Case number two uh, is also FDA inspection found widespread falsification of dates and the time in laboratory records for subject sample extractions. And there's apparent manipulation of equilibration of prep run samples to meet predetermined acceptance criteria. And there are lack of documentation re regarding equilibration or prep runs preventing to conduct an adequate internal investigation to determine the extent and the impact of these violations. So the classification for the um, for this uh, inspection for the size OAI. And I, FDA recommend a similar uh, recommendation as the case one, which is re assay the samples at the uh, other side, provide um, established stability data, or they have to repeat the pipeline study at the other side, or they can conduct a third party audit of the study. Now, case number three, uh, this actually is actually found by a reviewer. So the reviewer found unusual trend in concentration data, which triggered an announce, unannounced uh, for cost inspection. Now, OCC inspection found that there's a sample substitution and manipulation. There's a del deliberately removing certain samples, sample data to meet by equivalence criteria. Then there's a multiple study effect they also conduct a software analysis identified that similar PK profiles between subjects in B studies. So the classification for this site also OAI. Uh, however, the FDA recommendation for this site is only one option is repeat all the study conducted by this CRO at the other side. Case number four is different than previous three cases because OSIS classification is VAI. However, by analytical investigation, either use software tools or other methods from many overlapping or nearly identical, identical concentration time profiles, that is similar concentrations at all the sampling time points. They also found a distinguishable distribution pattern of TR ratios for CMAX and AUC, that is the distinguished groups of subjects where TR ratio for PK parameters for individual groups either above or below one. I will further explain this two type of data anomaly in the next two slides uh, using example. Um, and also subjects, so they also found a subject um, with overlapping PK profile appeared in the page of notebook in the freezer room. This is found by OSIS inspection. So FDA recommendation is uh, that um, firm has to repeat all the study conduct by the CRO um, at, at the site. This next, this slide and next slides explain uh, what is the data anomaly for uh, unusual PK trend on, on the overlapping PK profile. As you can see the graph in the bottom show, uh, the y-axis show that TR ratio for AUCT 
and the x axis is the subject number. You can see um, from subject one to subject 37, the TR ratio for UCT actually is relative high. It's above um, one, and after that, from 37 to 72, and the TR ratio for UCT is all below one. And the, the table above this graph may be even better to see this uh, type of uh, data anomaly. You can see the uh, in the table subject 1 to 37, the AUCT um, at the same max, the point estimate is very high. It's 1.4, around 1.42 and 1.33. And for this group, and if you do statistic analysis, they will fail to meet the uh, bicron's ac acceptance criteria. Uh, and feel that at the high end. And then the second group, the 37 to, uh, 37 to 72, and same X and UCT, you can see point estimate is around 0 0.7, uh, 67 and 0 0.7. And again, if you conduct statistic analysis and this group also fill by Kuhn's criteria. However, if you combine these two groups, that make the point as Point estimate back to close to one uh, is 1.07 for CMAX, 1.02 for AUCT, and study pass uh, the bicron's criteria. So our the next slide, um, this show the overlapping PK profile uh, in this case. Um, the graph, three graphs, um, the y-axis is concentration and the x-axis is sample number. And you can see the the blue plots and the red plots is from different subjects. And you can see the uh, PK profile is almost point-to-point -point overlapping. And also from the notebook documenting the subject pairs uh, that have uh, nearly identical concentration time profiles. Um, Then case five is another case to show uh, this pro this uh, drug you can see AUCT and CMAX the SWR is uh, greater than 0 0.3 so this is a high variability drug and so normally if it's high variability it's very hard for PK profile from different subjects show overlapping however you can see the graph here the y axis is concentration the um, X axis is time, and the blue line and the red line have a lot of overlapping points. And if you further look into their TR ratio pattern, um, in this slide, um, you show the top one is show the TR ratio for CMAX, and lower graph is the TR ratio for AUCT. The Y axis is the TR ratio, and the X axis is by analytical order. As you can see from subject 1 to 23, show the very low TR, TR, TR ratio is below 1, and then the after 23, rest of subjects show the high TR ratio is above 1. And uh, we further uh, looked into clinical reports, and several subjects with uh, identical uh, demographics uh, seems to that from the same subject uh, also uh, case report form included uh, multiple changes, for example, change the agenda, change the study number, and job out status. And case four and case five is actually from the same side. So from the case I presented before, you can see an uh, applicant often found itself confronting the state integrity issues post FDA inspection. And it's in the already in the very late stage in the review process. So they often re result the delay in drug product approval. So um, therefore, um, the app can, uh, should establish a proactive quality management system and a risk-based monitoring. And that way, the applicant may discover significant data integrity issues on its own. And this is self-discovery and subsequently early reporting prior to FDA inspection will help them building a relationship of trust with the regulatory authority. 
And also, early reporting to FDA may also help applicants determine the most effect, cost-effective way and additional steps to assure the reliability of data. So to summarize, um, the applicants and the regulatory authority should work together to ensure data integrity and data quality. And let, lack of data reliability would have a negative impact on the acceptability of data submitted in the support of marketing application. And a careful risk assessment should be performed by applicants to identify the areas of criticality and guide appropriate allocation of resources for oversight of all data management process and the procedures. The quality control should be applied to ensure that all data are reliable. Communicate with the regulatory agency as early as possible after a significant issue is identified. So for future steps, we should enhance international uh, collaboration and enhance regulatory oversight to assure data integrity. Uh, should increase the effectiveness of regulatory authorities and a better guide sources allocation for inspection coverage. And it should explore an alternative way, explore better an alternative way to detect similarities and or trends arising out of a fraud that is hard to detect by on-site inspection. This slide shows some uh, reference for uh, data integrity guidance. And I also like to, would like to acknowledge um, the contribution um, of Office gener Generic Drug for leadership's guidance and uh, for working group's contribution for this uh, project. And I also want to acknowledge contribution from other offices, uh, including the Office of St Study, Integrity, and Surveillance. Office of Generic Drug Policy and Office of Biostatistics. The next two slides is challenge question. The question one, integrity of data refer to data that is A, accurate, B, complete, C, consistent, D, all of above. Please take seconds to decide which answer you're gonna pick. The answer is D, all of above. Question two, applicants self-discovery and the subsequently early reporting prior to regulatory authorities inspection can help build a relationship of trust with the regulatory authority and help an applicant determine when is the most cost effective, what additional steps must be taken to assure FDA of the reliability of the data. A, true, and B, false. The answer is A, true. This concludes my presentation. I will come back for um, questions in Q&A section. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I am glad to have the opportunity today to speak to you on data integrity issues from BA, BE, clinical site inspection. I am also going to tell you a few case studies and OSIS evaluation. The learning objectives for today's talk include to understand the FDA bio-research monitoring BIMO program to understand the documentation expectations specified in BIMO Compliance Program 7348-003, and to understand the potential impact of documentation or lack thereof on data integrity of BA, BE clinical studies. I will give you an overview of the FDA BIMO program and the Compliance Program 7348-003, and the documentation expectation. I will also tell you a few case studies and their impact of documentation or lack thereof 
on data integrity of DABE clinical studies. FDA's Bioresearch Monitoring BIMO program is a comprehensive program of on-site inspections and data audits designed to monitor all aspects of the conduct and the reporting of FDA-regulated research. The BIMO program was established to assure the quality and the integrity of data submitted to FDA in support of new product approvals and marketing applications, as well as to provide for protection of the rights and welfare of the thousands of human subjects and animals involved in FDA-regulated research. The program is implemented domestically and internationally through seven multi-center compliance programs. I have a list of those programs on the slide here, and you may also find them on the FDA website. IMO Compliance Program 7348-003 is titled In Vivo Bioavailability Bioequivalent Studies Clinical. It became effective from May 1st of 2018 and covered the BAB studies conducted to support ANDAs, NDAs, and BLAs. Under Part 3 Inspectional, there were 11 sections that specified the expectations of the clinical conduct of BAB studies. The following chart shows the flow of subject samples in the regular BAB studies. The subjects would get dosed with the investigational product at the clinical sites. Then the blood samples were collected, processed, stored, and transferred to the bioanalytical sites for further bioanalysis. During this process, some critical information should be documented. For example, during sample collection, what was the allowable collection windows, what anticoagulant was used, and what was the temperature of sample collection. During sample processing, how long was the centrifugation, and what was the temperature. During storage and transferring, what was the matrix of the sample? Was there any hemolysis? How many aliquots? And what was the temperature of storage and transferring? Those information should be documented at the clinical site. BIMO Compliance Program 7348-0003, Section 5, specifies the collection, processing, and storage of study sample subjects to bioanalysis. For example, for sample collection, was the sample collection performed according to the study protocol and the applicable site SOPs? If samples were collected at protocol specified time points and within allowable time windows, if the samples were not collected within the allowable time windows, was those documented and reported as protocol deviations. And for sample processing, were the samples handled properly per the study protocol and the site SOPs? Were the critical steps during sample processing properly documented? For example, if the duration and settings of sample centrifugation and the time until further storage were consistent with specifications in the protocol. Sample storage. Were the temperature records for freezers where study samples were stored available? And for sample shipping and transfer, were there sufficient records to track transfer and shipments of samples from the clinical site to an analytical lab? For the accountability of samples, were there adequate records of the total number of samples collected, total number of samples sent, samples that were missing, lost, or within an insufficient volume, if any, and shipping records of each shipment 
in case of multiple aliquots. Now let me tell you um, a few case studies. Case study number one. This was a randomized open label, crossover, multi-center, pivotal in vivo bioavailability BA study with PK endpoints. For sample collection and the processing, the clinical sites were responsible of the initial time points after dosing. For the extended time points after dosing, the sponsor used a CRO for PK sample collection and processing. Relevant sample collection and processing forms were provided by the sponsor to the clinical sites and the CRO. The CRO subsequently distributed the forms to the independent nurses who actually performed the sample collection and processing at extended time points. During the inspection, the following objectionable findings were noted. Specifically, documentation for study subject PK sample collection and or processing at certain time points were missing or inconsistent. Here on the right, I am showing you a mark form to illustrate those objectionable findings. You can see that the study number, subject ID, date of visit, visit number, and also relevant sections for sample collection, sample processing, and sample shipping were included in this form. However, there were a few missing or inconsistent um, sections. For example, on the PK blood sample collection, the scheduled collection time was 1525. However, the actual collection time was 1530, five minutes outside of the um, scheduled collection time. In the question out of window, plus minus three minutes, it was noted as yes, but there was no comments to explain what was the situation and if this incident was documented as a protocol deviation. Next, under the sample processing and the storage, the centrifuge start time and condition was noted as 1700 hour at four degree, but centrifuge stop time and the condition was blank. Therefore, there was no way for us to reconstruct how long the sample was centrifugated for and under what condition. And for the process sample transfer time to freezer, it was documented as 1650, which was 10 minutes prior to the centrifuge start time. In reality, it was impossible. So there must be some documentation error. However, that was not captured or identified by the clinical site uh, personnel. Last but not least, under the PK blood sample shipping, the shipping date was noted as January 1st, 2023. However, if you go back to the top of the form, the date of visit was actually January 2nd of 2023. So there was no way the PK blood was shipped one day prior to the subject actually visited the clinic site. So those are a few examples that were showing you those missing or inconsistent information during sample collection and processing at the clinical site. Without accurate documentation, it was impossible to reconstruct the conditions subject samples underwent during collection and processing. Therefore, OSIS concluded that some concentration data of the affected subject samples are not reliable based on the provided information. Case study number two. This was a randomized open label multi-center pivotal in vivo BA study with PK endpoint. The drug product was unstable in whole blood and will quickly convert to active moiety depending on the storage conditions. For sample collection and the processing, the clinical sites were responsible. Specific instructions for PK sample collection and the processing were provided in the laboratory manual. However, 
the sponsor did not provide any relevant forms to the clinical sites to document sample collection and processing. During the inspection, the following objectionable findings were noted. Specifically, there was no written documentation for subject sample collection and processing. The clinical site personnel admitted to not completely following the sample collection and or processing procedures specified in the laboratory manual, including the critical steps of the temperature control and the centrifugation. However, these deviations were not documented contemporaneously and were not reported. Without documentation, it was impossible to reconstruct the conditions the subject samples underwent during collection and the processing. Therefore, OSIS concluded that the concentration data of the affected subject samples are not reliable based on the available information. In the BIMO Compliance Program 7348003, Section 3 also talk about subject records and documentations. Specifically, the source records should be maintained and kept at the clinical site, including the informed consent, the study um, subject eligibility criteria, like inclusion, exclusion criteria, and the study-related activities, their medical history, uh, any adverse events they may experience, and also the concomitant medications in the study. Also, other study records were also expected to be maintained, including but not limited to the administrative study files, correspondence files, signing logs, financial disclosure records, written agreements, and third-party storage records. Here's a case study for study records. This was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, multi-center pivotal in vivo BE study with clinical endpoint. The drug product was a topical product. And um, for documentation of dosing, the subjects were given a diary card to capture dosing details and to document any changes in their skin reactions, any adverse events, and co-committed medications during the study. Subjects then were asked to return the completed diary cards to the clinical site at each visit. Subsequently, the clinical site staff would verify if the subject complied within the dosage requirements and sign off of the completed diary cards. During the inspection, there were some interesting findings. As I'm showing you here, the three diary cards that were collected from two subjects. Left and middle, those were the diary cards collected from subject one, period one, and period two, respectively. And the diary card on the right was from subject B, period one. As you can see here, the dosing time were actually similar or even identical for different subjects. And also, there was a very unique green ink pen used in the, the form on the left and also the card on the right by different subjects. And you may also find that the handwriting was similar of those two cards by different subjects. However, when you compare the handwriting from the card on the left and the card in the middle, even though they were from supposedly from the same subject, subject A, the handwriting appeared to be different. Without proper and reliable documentation, it was difficult to reconstruct the self-dosing compliance. Therefore, OSIS concluded that the data generated from the affected study subjects are not reliable. To summarize, I hope you would appreciate that the documentation of study-related activities is critical 
during conduct of clinical BA B studies. Lack of adequate annual complete documentation may have negative impact on study data integrity. The BIMO Compliance Program 7348-003 lists examples of documentation that are expected to be reviewed during the BAB clinical inspections. And here are some references that I used or cited during my presentation. You can find those information on the FDA website. I also listed a few guidance documents that you may find helpful. With that, I would like to thank my colleagues from the Office of Study Integrity and Surveillance, Division of New Drug Study Integrity. I appreciate their contribution and input to make this presentation possible. Next, time for challenge questions. Challenge question number one, true or false? There is no documentation requirement or expectation for in vivo BAB studies. A true, B false, C depends. The answer is B false. Challenge question number two. According to BIMO Compliance Program 7348-003, which of the following subject sample records would be reviewed during a BIMO BAB clinical inspection? A, sample collection record, B, sample processing record, C, sample storage records, D, sample transfer and shipping records, E, all of the above. The answer is E, all of the above. Thank you so much for your attention. I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you all for the great presentations, and we look forward to seeing you back on our last Q&A panel at the end of the day. We'll now transition into our afternoon break until 2.05 p.m. Eastern Time. Please enjoy the break.